Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome uh, on behalf of the Heart Failure Policy Network to the Heart Failure Policy Summit. Thank you for joining us from all across Europe and beyond. My name is Professor Tini Jarsma, and I'm a professor of nursing science at Lenzeping University in Sweden and the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And my professional activities revolve around one central theme, living a good life with chronic heart disease. And for these reasons, I'm very pleased to chair this final session of the 2022 Heart Failure Policy Summit, living well with heart failure, moving towards a more person-centered and integrated care. I would like to start with acknowledging the summit sponsors, which are Buringer Ingelheim, Roche Diagnostics, AstraZeneca, and CSL Pfeiffer, and without whom it would not have been possible to host this summit or this session today. And I would also like to say a huge thank you to today's speakers who are all volunteering their time for free. The Heart Failure Policy Network is a multi-stakeholder platform formed in 2015 to research and develop policy recommendations and raise awareness to improve care for people with heart failure, bringing together pol policymakers, patient advocates, healthcare professionals and experts. So the aim is to ensure that every person in every country can receive the same high standard of heart failure care. And there has, this summit has actually consisted of four sessions. Uh, and so far we have looked at how uh, to elevate heart failure in national and international policy, the role of innovation in heart failure care and diagnosis and the impact uh, of health inequalities. And I would like to, to invite you to look them up as soon as they're available for you to look at. But today we have the fourth and final session and which we will focus on the importance of Qual uh, on focusing of quality of life of people with heart failure. And we will be discussing the roles that person-centered and integrated care can play in protecting and improving quality of life. And we will hear from the, a broad group of experts. And uh, we have uh, the president of the ESC of the Heart Failure Association. We have two advocates with lived experience of heart failure. And uh, we have academic experts in quality of life person-centered care, representatives but they took two case studies, and we also will have in the end a session with a round table discussion. I would like to welcome our first speaker of today, Professor Marco Metro. He is the president-elect of the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology. He's also currently the editor-in-chief of the European Journal of, Car uh, Journal of Heart Failure. And also, of course, was very important in the chairing the guidelines task force for the most recent European Society of Cardiology guidelines published in 2021. And he will uh, speak to us about evidence-based care for heart failure, a call to action. Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tini. Thank you very much. Uh, so I start sharing my screen. And and here we are. So my topic, I think I'm here as a well, advocate of a better life for patients with heart failure and uh, to point out which is uh, the, the current approach of uh, uh, that has been taken by the heart failure guidelines. We uh, had uh, in uh, uh, 2021, September, uh, the guidelines by the European Society of Cardiology, ESC, on heart failure. And uh, uh, one year uh, after, we had uh, the guidelines by uh, the US uh, societies and associations that are, it is to the, to the right. And uh, uh, so what the first exercise I did is this one. Uh, I uh, looked for the number of times uh, that the different endpoints in, uh, uh, in uh, our failure trials are uh, uh, quoted in uh, the guidelines. You have in red the, the American guidelines and in uh, blue violet the ESC guidelines. And you see that by far uh, events, uh, major events, mortality and hospitalizations uh, are those that are uh, mostly represented. 
uh, then we may have symptom, symptoms and exercise uh, which are not necessarily quality of life. So they are a component, uh, surely a determinant of the quality of life, but not everything. Uh, then we have quality of life, and then uh, we have symptoms like breathlessness. But uh, the, the current guidelines, both we will see the European and the Americans, uh, remain uh, focused uh, very much on uh, uh, events. Uh, even if uh, it's, a, uh, it's a matter of fact that quality of life is now accepted as a, a primary uh, endpoint and uh, its improvement may be a reason for approval uh, of one drug as uh, stated in the uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, recent uh, paper. And, uh, and so we, we may, um, uh, quality of life uh, may have the same uh, in value that uh, outcomes may have. And uh, in uh, patients with advanced heart failure, quality of life may be even more important. Uh, let's see how many times quality of life and uh, for which topics uh, quality of life is uh, mentioned in the American guidance. You see that uh, uh, with many interventions, uh, even uh, those that we know that uh, have an effect on quality of life, quality of life is not uh, mentioned in a table of recommendation. It is mentioned for exercise training and rehabilitation, and it's a, a major uh, determinant of uh, uh, the class of recommendation. It is in the US guidance mentioned for CRT, for LVAD, for iron replation, and for uh, AF ablation. Uh, in other cases, uh, and we will come back to this, uh, despite even if the intervention has an impact on quality of life, a typical example is uh, SJT2 inhibitors, uh, the improvement in quality of life is not mentioned in the, uh, in the table of recommendation. Uh, these are, uh, for example, the recommendations that we have for uh, treatment of FPF. And you see that uh, quality of life is mentioned only with regards of a contraindication, that is to say, uh, uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors uh, rather than for an indication. This is taken uh, from the ESC guidelines. And you see that quality of life is not mentioned for uh, medical treatment. It is mentioned for exercise rehabilitation and permanent elevate or heart transplantation. And it is mentioned for iron replation. All the other uh, treatment, uh, they do not have a, a recommendation uh, based on quality of life. Uh, this uh, is the central figure of uh, uh, the ESC guidelines. And you see that uh, uh, the, the, the major aspect is that uh, uh, drugs are given to reduce mortality and to reduce our failure hospitalizations. And uh, here we have not only the four pillars of uh, uh, medical treatment of our failure with reduced ejection fraction, but we have a treatment of congestion, we have devices, CRT, and we have a treatment of all uh, these many comorbidities. So uh, uh, treatment is individualized, but uh, again, uh, the only reason uh, to prescribe drugs is the improvement in outcomes. Uh, we uh, can find the quality of life here below uh, for exercise rehabilitation and for multiprofessional disease management programs. Uh, so we have quality of life, but in a relatively restricted uh, field. Here you have the recommendations for um, cardiac rehabilitation. Here uh, we have uh, 
quality of life in a, a comprehensive disease management program as a, a main component of this, but uh, it's not the only component. Um, you, you will have a presentation by uh, John Spertus that will go uh, in deep into quality of life assessment. Here, yeah, just to remember uh, the indications to ferric carboxymaltose, because in this case, uh, uh, this is an indication also for the improvement in quality of life. Uh, we have uh, uh, quality of life in palliative for palliative care and uh, uh, for, for treatment of atrial fibrillation uh, from some point of view as it is uh, uh, was regarded mainly as uh, uh, symptomatic treatment. Uh, so coming uh, to um, just uh, finishing in a little in a little while, Coming to the uh, uh, major recommendation for medical treatment of the patients with FREF, uh, you see that they are recommended for the uh, reduction in mortality. But uh, at least uh, luckily enough, we have to remember that even among the four pillars, an improvement in quality of life was uh, uh, seen and described with uh, Sacubiti Varsartan versus uh, um, versus uh, uh, ACE inhibitor in a paradigm HF, and a significant, an highly significant improvement in quality of life was shown in the double-blind placebo-controlled trials in uh, patients with FREF with uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Here you have the results with the dapaglifosin versus placebo, showing a consistent improvement across all the different measurements of quality of life. And here we have very similar data, although represented differently, with respect of quality of life in emperor reduced. All the domains were improved. It doesn't matter from where, from, uh, where the patient started. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, finally the table that we have in the ESC guidelines uh, uh, regarding quality of life. And uh, you see that we uh, uh, put together and listed a, a series of uh, medical uh, treatments for uh, FRF that have an impact on quality of life. Uh, we, above all, uh, listed uh, devices and invasive procedures that affect quality of life. And uh, uh, these include the CRT, as we have already seen, pulmonary vein ablation, because uh, uh, and for treatment and the prevention of atrial fibrillation uh, episodes. A, um, and then we have percutaneous correction of functional mitral regurgitation but also cardiac contractile uh, contractility modulation, uh, baroreflex activation therapy, and uh, phrenic nerve stimulation uh, for central sleep apnea have an impact on uh, quality of life. And then, of course, mechanical circulatory support and air transplantation and exercise training. So we have a series of uh, interventions they, they have an impact on quality of life. Uh, they include the interventions that uh, uh, affect uh, outcomes, uh, but uh, also interventions where a, an effect on the outcomes was not demonstrated yet. So, uh, il, uh, so um, uh, despite this, quality of life has not a major role, I must say, in the current uh, guidelines. Uh, it has been in some way overshadowed by uh, the effects of mortality and morbidity that we finally uh, found with uh, SGT2 inhibitors. Uh, it may suffer for uh, insufficient standardization and endorsement, as I said. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the statement on F by the FDA on quality of life. And uh, with this, I leave you. Uh, um, I leave the podium and then finish my discussion. My Thank you. Thank you, Professor Metra, for this wonderful and clear talk. And um, 
there is a lot of work to do then in measurement and in reporting on quality of life. So thank you for that. If people have questions, they can put them in the question and answering chat and we will hopefully discuss uh, your questions. I would now like to welcome Nick Hartston Evans and Stephen Macari to the session. Uh, Mr. Hudson Evans is the CEO of Pumping Marvelous, a patient-led heart failure charity based in the UK. And Mr. Macari is the president of the association VA Coeur Avec, a patient advocacy and support group for people living with heart failure in France. And they will be speaking with the uh, HFPN network director at Harding about their recent work on a major pan-European survey and report, Heart Failure, an Inconvenient Truth. The floor is yours. Thank you. For my part, thank you and uh, for giving us the chance to discuss this. Okay, this is the, the document concerned, Heart Failure, an Inconvenient Truth, uh, which was published, uh, launched this year. Um, and it is a pan-European a uh, paper which emanates from a pan-European um, piece of uh, survey. Okay, and the, the four main uh, contributors in terms of patient organizations are Pumping Marvelous, uh, AVEC, um, German Heart Failure and Dutch Heart Failure Association. So I'm not gonna try and pronounce Winfried's uh, uh, the association name, okay? This is a little disclaimer. And if we move on to, there we go. An overview of the correspondence. I think it's um, it's quite interesting to, to show the demographics of the population. Um, and interestingly enough, which something that we discovered uh, fairly recently on rereading, uh, and not looking just at quality of life, is actually the proportion of uh, younger patients who are employed or unemployed who, or who are active professionally um, that are that answered the survey. There were uh, 570 total per, uh, respondents. Uh, the answers were diverse and representative, covering all groups and gender, education levels, etc. Uh, what stands out is that one in five uh, people declare themselves, self-declare themselves as disabled. And also, like I said, this interesting fact that age percentages here tend to go contrary to, to, to current thinking. Thank you, Stephen. Um, pleasure to discuss this really important piece of work with you. Uh, Nick and Stephen, we've been working together for you know for many years in the Heart Failure Policy Network, and I cast my mind back to in 2015 when we started the project. I mean, right from the back, we've been talking about multidisciplinary care and heart failure, the importance of managing comorbidities. Um, why why isn't that enough? We just heard from Professor Marco Metra that it, al although we need to increase um, the focus on quality of life and guidelines, there's still you know we've got a very robust scientific base in in terms of the uh, medical treatment of heart failure. We know what to do, as one clinician said to me, we just don't do it. What is it about heart failure that makes quality of life so important? Nick, can I give that to you? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, I think the, 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 the challenge with heart failure and what, what you don't see if you haven't got heart failure or you don't work in the, the, the heart failure arena is the, um, the, I hate the word burden, but it is a burden of the symptoms the symptoms of breathlessness and fatigue uh, can be are, are, are many times consistent and constant, um, and you know they do get worse or they do get better. Um, but sometimes you can have heart failure and you can be constantly out of breath and fatigue. Um, so therefore, the impact on your life uh, as a as an individual living with heart failure. And I like to use the word living with heart failure because you can live with heart failure. Is is impacted significantly by. Um, the sort of general symptoms um and you know the word doesn't help either does it let's let's be let's be clear um but you know we're not going to change that but definitely the symptom burden is is significant thank you and and, and why now why why is it what why the timing of this report what um what problem does it address what gap in our knowledge has it really sought to plug well it, it's it's a uh, you're right, Stephen, with this. Can I take yeah, this yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, 
it's it is the first publication that's uh, published pan european wide serving people living with heart failure and it it's a very timely um and uh yeah timely uh, publication that helps um potentially challenge some of the historical ways that we've been doing things um and um, traditionally heart failure has been very much seen as a as an old person's condition but um this survey covers a very very wide uh, range of people so we can say that heart failure is um uh, multi-generational and it does impact all generations um we understand the prevalence may be higher or is higher in, in the elderly but it does impact all generations and um we, we, what the what the survey and, and what the document really does say is that actually the system is working against um the wishes of patients um in terms of we understand uh, mortality uh, length of life is important to patients we understand that but we pegged that now equally nearly equally um uh, with the quality of life angle and what we don't do is we don't measure quality of life effectively i think one of the slides previously reflected that and um therefore uh, i think patient advocates and patient organizations and patients themselves would then question what is the what is the target outcome of medications what is the target outcome of clinical trials that shape the evidence uh, uh health system we live in Thank I you. think Professor Matthew so I just add he he highlighted that in saying that our quality of life is not a primary out point uh endpoint sorry in uh clinical trials and Stephen could take back to you again and you know anyone who's if you have a look at the report you'll see it's full of incredibly interesting findings um about the nature of quality of life and the relationship of patients with quality of life um could you summarize some of those findings for us um well, like I said previously, uh, we found that one in five patients could themselves is disabled, uh, which would, you know, is directly related to the idea of quality of life. They're not able to do uh, what they, they, they used to do. And as Nick said, there's no significant difference between mortality and quality of life in the findings and the, uh, the answers. Um, so that new treatments really should focus on both of these points. Um, we we know that uh, patients define quality of life uh, over many factors, physical and mental well-being, uh, relationships, fun, social community, etc. This means that if we are feeling low in quality of life, then they're not being able to pursue these goals, uh, which uh, uh, everybody else in society uh, esteems adds to their quality of life. Um, there are no, in, in, in terms of the conversation between healthcare professionals and uh, patients, there is a distinct uh, indication that in actual fact that the problem is not even being dis discussed in a consultation uh, situation and that patients would really like this to be, uh, to be increased. Also, that they would really like to be more involved in uh, the, the discussion of their their uh, health care. Thank you. Um, Nick, turning back to you, so if you've got decision makers, payers, you know, watching this, they'll be thinking, well, hold on, I, I, I pay already for cardiologists, cardiology wards, even if we're lucky, heart failure specialists, nurses, clinics, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, why this should be enough. What, 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 are these, what, are these, what do these findings tell them? What are the implications for how they should be looking at the, the care and the support services they commission. Are they getting value from what they've previously had in place? So I think the research clarifies a lot of what patients actually feel living with heart failure and, um, and potentially how maybe things have gone wrong in the past and what we now need to, or how we now need to think in a new age of dealing with heart failure, where we have a, um, a, a block, um, not a huge block, but a block of um, uh, uh, therapies and treatments that do uh, make a difference. Um, so one of the words used was, um, it's not just about delivering survival because um, you can survive for a long time, and uh, but you can do it poorly and your quality of life is hugely impacted. So um, 
we knew this as patient advocates before any guidelines were written, um, both on a, on a national and international level. Um, and I think the WHF roadmap was put in place, um, but we lacked evidence. We lack key evidence on heart failure specifically, and you know, evidence, evidence, evidence is always about evidence in in, in evidence based systems. Uh, but I think we can challenge that strongly by uh, with this inconvenient truth, um, uh, which is a, a really good representation, I would say, of how people actually feel. Um, and you know, if I was a government, I would want um, significant value. Um, I would want to make uh, people happy. Uh, or happy that we're actually trying to do something about it, which which ultimately, you know, this is about targeting their quality of life. But historically, we haven't done that. Um, we when we were studying the the uh, the document, the Inconvenient Truth document, um, white paper. Um, one of the things we did notice was that sixty percent of the respondents were working age. Now I always get told it's absolutely always a uh, it's a it's an elderly condition, but. 60% of the respondents were of a working age, but only 20% of those were in employment. And I can, I could probably get, you know, if we drilled down further with those people, we'd, we'd understand that heart failure would be one of those things that prevents them from getting back into what for many people, uh, employment is part of their normal life. Um, I'm not saying that normal life can be achieved back with heart failure, but you can, you can create a horrible word, but new normal um but we've used that for many many years before the pandemic um and i think what it yeah what it what it adds is clarity um the healthcare must deliver on quality of life and um, if you have people who are who have a better quality of life i'm not saying that we can make it brilliant always because heart failure is a tough gig it's a difficult condition to manage but if we can improve it and we can focus on that improvement. I would even go to challenge and say that how we measure it is in a very sterile environment in clinical trials. And we need to start understanding how we better manage quality of life because maybe we it, it isn't representative what comes out of, quali- out of um, clinical trials because it's a very sterile, very, very managed specific environment. So. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Last... Sorry. sorry. <laughs> No Sorry, Ed, you, if you have a last question, please make it short because we're already running over time. Thank you. Got it. Um, and just very briefly, so in terms of what, what would be your key take home for um, for government, some of the key stakeholders from this, what do you want to see going forward? Stephen, do you? Um, quality of life um, is, is important for uh, uh, for uh, for people living with it and, and living with that and what it means for the governments then really if you want a return on your investment financially, then we really need to um, to get to a situation where people are more comfortable with their life, their quality of life, and less of a burden on uh, the healthcare system. That's financially. Um, by reducing hospitalization and, um, and mortality is not the only avenue. Thank you. I think we will have to end it there, but I, I'm, I'm sure uh, I found the report fascinating. I'm sure colleagues will, um, whether you're living with heart failure or healthcare professional or involved in health system design. So huge thank you, Nick and Stephen. Such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and my apologies for being the time police, but that's what I'm <laughs> supposed to be today. Uh, so thank you so much for discussing this in, in an international and innovative way also to bring it us to us. Uh, and uh, we are now still in this our stop section of today, quality of life and person-centered care, vision into reality. And we have an excellent speaker who can take us further on that. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Axel Wolf from the University of Gothenburg Center for Person-Centered Care in Sweden. And Professor Wolf has been involved in research around person-centered care in heart failure for a long time, as long as I know him at least. And he's very, has very interesting publications in this area. And he will talk to us about person-centered care agenda 2032. So Axel, enlighten us. Thanks, Tiffany. And thank you for, for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic. As I said, it's, it's, it's not easy to, to know the future, but uh, I try to go back into the future 10 years from now and look at how, how the agenda looks like in 2032. And, and my vision is that we have a system in place that combines 
uh, what we're talking about. So both a person-centered integrated care system that is combining, of course, also personalized medicine or precision medicine or what you call it. So I liked really the comment from, from Nick and Steven that we need both outcomes and of course we need all perspectives to make a system that is both cost containing and that improves the quality of healthcare for our patients and looking at it uh, i also think that uh, during that time we worked with the critical enablers that have been identified by the european we care consortium uh, that has published also their roadmap in in lancet in 2016 about uh, if you want to build uh, the future healthcare systems that are uh, both person-centered and that also are health-promoting. Uh, you need to have some critical enablers and facilitate those. And of course, what kind of quality of care and the seamless transition is, is of importance here. And, and of course, as always, cost and what kind of incentive systems we have for this change and, and the contracting strategies in order to promote this change are also important to have uh, a high quality and... Um, a cost containment or, or, or a system that has uh, low cost in itself. The combination of expertise, and we have the, the combination of the clinical expertise um, of our healthcare professionals, looking at the, at the science and the objective measurements. Um, but it's also important, and we talk about quality of life, but also look at the, the patient's perception and, and living with chronic heart failure, the, the symptoms of the patient and how he or she perceive it, but also the social determinants of, of living with heart failure and the psychosocial factors that we know are limiting the social life of the patient. And this is from a recent systematic review that was published in the European Journal of Cardiovascular Nursing uh, with the first author, Maji Olano Lizarraga from the University of Navarra. And looking at both, both, both of these together, the signs and the, and the symptoms and, and comprising this expertise, it becomes clearer for me at least that we, we should not only focus on the needs of the patient and, and putting those in the center, we need to co-create together with the patient and the family uh, our, our goals together. Uh, and in that sense, um, we are looking towards this partnership between the healthcare professional and the patient to, to make this alliance, which needs, of course, stand on the ethical standpoint of, of, of uh, the capable uh, person uh, and the human being. And that should guide us through our everyday practical actions. So this kind of ethical standpoint should not only be used when we have ethical dilemmas in care. We need to really work with them all the time. And that is mainly, mainly the, I think, one of the most important things that we need to consistently and continuously work uh, with all stakeholders, including the patient, uh, in order to work in a person-centered uh, approach. And looking at, at um, some, some um, things that you uh, could do in order to work in this kind of um, a partnership is to start with the patient's narrative and listen to the patient and together with your expertise as a, a clinician or, or the team uh, create a commonly agreed health plan together with the patient and and the family of course uh, and then also document it and revise it if needed and this of course is, is taken from the publication in in the european journal of cardiovascular nursing also uh, about the person-centered care ready for prime time um, that was released in 2011 and uh, talking about the F evidence of person-centered care, there is an increasing evidence and I chose here some of the overviews and reviews that have been published. On the left side you have a, a Cochrane review uh, with Angela Culture about personalized care planning and the effects of it. In the middle we have a, an overview of, of clinical trials from uh, using the Gothenburg model of person-centered care. Um, and on the right side, the newest uh, systematic review, a massive systematic review about the outcomes and also the cost effects of person-centered care in, in a range of different contexts and, uh, and illnesses. And if you look at some of the effects of, of person-centered care in different healthcare settings, you see that it both, uh, there is evidence that it improves self-efficacy and uh, reduces the uncertainty in illness of, of, of patients. Um, but it also seems to improve the work environment and satisfaction of the clinicians that are working in a person-centered way. And if you look on a more organizational level, um, 
studies have shown that it can improve the discharge process and reduce the number of, of hospitalization um, and also reducing length of hospital stay, for example, in some studies in, in, in also in chronic heart failure, and we'll come back to that, which of course reduces the cost of care. And looking at, at one uh, study um, which I was involved in uh, that we released in, in the European Heart Journal 10 years ago, uh, the PCCHF study, I want to show you uh, the primary outcome um, and the takeaways from the primary outcome, was, which was length of hospital stay. And the takeaways was that if you have a partnership that is built on this ethical standpoint, that the person, of course, needs to be part and co-create, and you do this consistently and continuously uh, during the uh, length of stay, you receive the highest effect. And here you see the chart. Uh, there was a control group uh, in this clinical trial. And in the middle, in the intention to treat analysis that you see, uh, ITT, we look at the entire intervention. And there we see a non-significant reduction of one day in length of hospital stay. But we had a predefined uh, per protocol analysis where we looked at all those patients in the intervention group that received uh, person-centered care. Uh, consistently and systematically throughout the entire stay. And there we saw a significant decrease in length of hospital stay by 2.5 days, which is 30% reduction. And this I interpret as if as person-centered care needs to be uh, provided consistently all the time by all the, the healthcare providers in order to reach the most effect. And what could then be the solution going forward now, uh, the next 10 years to reach our goal? And I think that, as I said uh, before, the patient, a partner in care, but also in education, uh, in research and development, and, and also in policy making. We need to involve patients and, and patient organizations more in this co-creation, because right now, uh, patient organization, when I talk to them, they feel a little bit about tokenism, that it, it's okay, it, it, we, we get asked the question if it if it's suits the, the researcher or the organization or when I as a clinician have time with person-centered care. And we need to move to empowerment, but also to co-creation together with the patient. And there I, I just show some of the initiatives that are around, like the European Patient Forum, Eupathy Education for Patient Researchers, uh, we also right now, since 2020, have a European standard for uh, the minimal requirements of patient involvement in healthcare. Um, and then, of course, also uh, in the, in the ref, uh, right corner, um, for example, the pressure point from the Heart Failure Policy Network that provides a, a very nice overview about uh, patient empowerment and, and self-care, which of course is an important aspect also in a, in a person-centered, integrated care system of the future. And with that, I think I will stop. Thank you. It's not easy to look into the future, so you, you get some <laughs> slack there. <laughs> so thank you so much for the vision into the future. And uh, again, if you have questions uh, or remarks to Professor Wolf, then please put it in the question and answer, and we'll take it a little bit later. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Professor John Spurtis. And he's a cardiologist and a professor of medicine in the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And of course, he's famous among our, us researchers and interested in quality of life because he developed the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, KCCQ. Uh, and it has been translated into over 19 languages. It has been used in a lot of research projects. But now he will talk about using patient reported outcomes in clinical practice, the next step in patient centered care. John, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, my disclosures, as articulated, is that I um, uh, wrote the KCCQ about 25 years ago. And so, as we think about sort of how to integrate uh, quality of life measures into clinical care, you know, it's very important to step back and realize that, you know, when we treat patients with heart failure, certainly we're trying to make patients live longer by preventing further progression of their disease. But a major goal in our care is to make patients feel better by improving their health status, their symptoms, function, and quality of life. And 
you know, patients care a lot, not only about survival, but about their quality of life. And, you know, this has already been emphasized by the prior speakers, but there was a very interesting study done a long time ago that uh, Eldrin Lewis did when he surveyed a uh, hundred consecutive patients in his clinic. And he gave them what's called the time trade-off. You know, how much time would you give up to be restored to perfect quality of life? And this is the distribution of responses that he got. And what's remarkable is that about a quarter of patients would have offered to give up half of their remaining survival if they could be restored to perfect health. And, you know, we need, therefore, to have a much better way of measuring, understanding the impact of heart failure on patients. And so, while as clinicians, we often focus a lot on the underlying disease process, you know, patients are unaware of what their ejection fraction is or their BNP is. What they're aware of, of are the symptoms of fatigue, shortness of breath, and lower extremity swelling that they have, how it limits their function, and how the limitations of their function and their symptoms deviate from how they like to be living, which therefore impacts their quality of life. And it is these latter concepts, the way that the disease manifests itself to patients, that we uh, seek to measure in quantifying patients' health status with patient-reported outcomes. You know, as uh, mentioned, you know, I've been involved in the KCCQ, and it seeks to sort of ask in a very consistent way the way heart failure impacts patients. And there's both the original 23-item version, but we've also created a 12-item version to be used in routine clinical care. And the symptoms can be summarized into a total symptom score. We can create a clinical summary score to mirror the New York Heart Association by integrating symptoms and function. And then we can try and capture the range of patients' disease-specific health status with an overall summary score. And importantly, this is the patient's perspective of their heart failure. It's been translated over 110 different languages and cultures. We've done a lot to demonstrate that it is a valid, re reliable, and sensitive measure of patients' heart failure. And the FDA has even qualified it as a clinical outcome assessment for clinical trial. And importantly, different scales of the KCCQ map directly to that conceptual framework. And the clinical summary score and the total summary score just seek to measure different uh, aspects of, of the different scales. So what are the advantages of using PROs in clinical care? From the patient perspective, I believe it can improve communication with their provider. And from the provider, it gives us a better understanding of patient's health status. Um, Joseph Stellock implemented the KCCQ at the University of Utah and published a qualitative study of patients' perspective. And patients, this was done in 24 patients where the KCCQ was used, and almost all of them felt that using the KCCQ gave their providers a better sense of their health, of their heart failure. 16 thought that it helped improve doctor-patient communication, and 22, almost all of them felt that it improved their care. But 17, almost two-thirds felt that more attention should have been given in the clinical visit to their KCCQ scores. And, you know, they really felt that this was important, but primarily if their doctors used them, which underscores the need for us to better train doctors and how to interpret and use this information. You know, they, something like the KCCQ can be very useful in monitoring health over time. And from physician's perspective, targeting the need for more additional therapy. So you can imagine a patient being serially followed with their KCCQ, and they go from 50 to 55 after we, uh, you know, at, at, over two months. And, and so sort of this signals that there may be a need for something more, whether further intensifying their medicines, considering cardiac resynchronization therapy. And in fact, when cardiac resynchronization therapy is 
implemented in this patient, there is a substantial improvement in their health status. However, they're still at 70. The goal is to get to 100. So can, are there additional medicines repleting their uh, iron stores for anemia, all offering SGLT2 inhibitors, refining uh, the timing of their CRT? By using this over time to follow patients, you can clearly recognize not only the improvements that have been made, but also the opportunities to further improve their health status and quality of life. I think that you know we could start to use these tools to actually measure the benefits of new treatments. You know, in heart failure, we've had the luxury now uh, after years of just having ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and MRAs to have a lot of new therapies that might be available, whether they're SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonists, whether they're uh, iron repletion, whether it's um, uh, versiguide or omicaptin macarbal. And, you know, the idea is that which of these do you do? What if we took patients with stable heart failure, we collected a KCCQ, and then we intensify therapy, increase the doses, added new therapies, and remeasured their KCCQ two months later. And for those patients who improve, well, then we continue the therapy or keep intensifying the therapy. But for those who don't, maybe we ought to be trying a new therapy. Again, using the patient's responses to treatments, and whether it's medicines, whether it's devices, whether it's lifestyle behaviors and diet, this seems to be a very important opportunity to tailor treatment to patients' quality of life benefits. And then, you know, ultimately, I believe, and this is the, the prior speakers have alluded to this, that we ought to be using tools like quality of life measures, such as the KCCQ, to uh, measure the quality of care being delivered, because having how they're doing be a part of quality assessment is probably very important to patients and certainly to payers. And this was a study where we looked at 100 clinics across the United States at the proportion of patients who had a KCCQ overall summary score of 75 or greater. And there were some clinics where none of the patients had such a, a, a good health status and in other clinics, almost 80% had excellent health status. And so when we adjusted for all the patient and the clinical characteristics associated, there was a median odds ratio of 1.7, meaning that the same patient going to one random clinic versus another random clinic had a 70% greater odds of having excellent quality of life as assessed by the KCCQ in one versus another clinic. That's an extraordinary amount of variation. And by starting to use PROs as quality measures could be very important in elevating the quality of care for all. So I'll end by saying pros uh, directly integrate patient experience into care. They can increase the accuracy of doctor-patient communication. They can help monitor patients over time. They can better quantify the benefits of treatment as well as the quality of care. And the time to start using them, I believe, is now. Thank you very much, and I'll end here. Thank you, Professor Spurtus. Wonderful talk. I cannot wait on, on, until this really will be implemented in practice, and you will have to invite you again to, to talk about that. So great talk. Thank you. So we now move to a little bit different subject, uh, and we have a speaker, Katalina Sernica, and she is the CEO of the Health and Happiness Foundation, a Danish NGO, which seeks to accelerate the adoption of happiness measures and frameworks in the design and delivery of better healthcare. And Catalina's work has been uh, mostly in dermatology, but she will now talk to us about also the importance of this in the arena of, cardi arena of cardiovascular disease. Uh, she will address putting well-being on the public agenda. The floor is yours, Catalina. Oh, thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much for the for the introduction. Um, I took a lot of notes, and I find um, the previous speaker very speakers very very insightful. And I hope that bring by bringing you a broader view of um, our approach in putting well-being and 
defining quality of life for uh, people living with chronic diseases um, in general, a little bit inspiring and informative for the specific area of um, heart failure. Um, like Tini already mentioned, I work for the Health and Happiness Research Foundation. And what we do is try to bring um, validated methodologies that are coming mainly from the space of economics and the space of um, um, social sciences into the clinical settings for a better understanding of what is important for patients. Because we think that we cannot talk about patient centricity uh, or integrating care without putting the well-being of people at the center of how we develop um, healthcare policies, how we develop uh, treatments, and how we look at measuring that in clinical trials, but also in how we develop uh, plan treatment plans. Because I worked in, in CVD as well, and patients, um, like um, has been mentioned before, will not um, always articulate you know, their uh, willingness and their to um, adhere to a treatment by saying, I want to improve my um, you know, um, chance of survival in the next five years by X percent. They express that by saying, I want to be able to walk my daughter down the aisle, or I want to be trusted again to um, babysit my grandchildren. So we come and ask, how can we actually capture the real patient experiences because it's about their lives, not only about their uh, diseases in, um, in, a, in a way that is relevant for a multitude of stakeholders from policymakers, from the HCPs and from the, uh, those who develop treatment and, and drugs. Um, I won't go, as I said, if you're interested in uh, more details about the methodologies and how we do it, I'm happy to, to share more details. But I'm here today to talk about one a uh, case study we had in um, in dermatology, in uh, psoriatic disease, where we basically uh, getting inspiration from the World Happiness Report that is um, published by the UN in uh, every year in March and using some of the same uh, methodologies on a population of people living with psoriasis. We published our own World Psoriasis Happiness Reports two years in a row in 2017 and 2018. Um, the data was collected between 16 and 19. Uh, we have a total um, database of over 200,000 um, people with, living with psoriasis across the world that have uh, responded to our surveys. The um, 2018 report covers 21 countries and a sample of about 80,000 um, respondents um, uh, in, in, with samples varying from roughly 400 to uh, almost 10,000 in different countries. And the um, reports have a lot of data that covers um, different areas of what it means to live with psoriasis from a perspective of patients, but also putting in the context of, for instance, economic costs, because we talked about what it means not to be able to work fully, to participate fully in uh, in your workplace, or not being able um, to live a fully normal life. We also try to put um, a framework on how to talk about the impact of stigma and self-esteem, or um, stress that is important in this in this situation in mental health in general that um, current measures health related measures in dermatology but also in other diseases tend to focus more on the physical symptoms and don't put the same weight on aspects of living especially mental and social well-being that are important for patients i'm going to give you just a couple of examples of how this data can be used to raise awareness around the importance of understanding quality of life for patients. Um, and in this case, for instance, if um, the percentage of people um, living with psoriasis that have reported happiness that is lower than four on the Gallup scale from zero to 10 is 10 times more in the US um, in comparison to average uh, numbers in, in, in the country. 
So if you live with psoriasis, you're 10 times most likely to live in what is called in misery. And that, is, that puts things in perspective from a policy um, angle. We also look at topics like um, loneliness, which especially with the last couple of years um, has gained more attention uh, in the, on the social agenda. And we have shown that uh, about half of the people living with psoriasis are affected by loneliness, which in countries like Denmark can be to up to six times uh, more prevalent in this specific group than in the general population. And there are already uh, data sets um, that uh, estimate the impact of loneliness on the economy, on in general, on the cost of healthcare. And it has shown that actually addressing um, aspects like loneliness for specific chronic diseases can improve not only the, the patient outcomes, but also bring um, cost uh, reductions and savings to the system. And it's an important ongoing topic about uh, around loneliness. Um, mm -hmm. We also shown that is clearly a strict correlation between, um, there is correlation between the um, impact, the prevalence of mental health issues, mental health illness and living with psoriasis. And we show that on our uh, sample of 2021 20, countries. And we also have developed what we call the happiness gap that actually captures the, um, the differences in different um, variables across aspects of well being from social, mental, and physical um, symptoms. And compare it to general population, it really, it really. Uh, paints a very vivid uh, picture of how important quality of life is for patients living with psoriasis. And um, I think this uh, talks very well to the point that Professor Spertus was uh, making earlier. We have shown in this data that really having the right conversation with the doctor is very important for uh, patient um, outcomes and for um, well-being in general. So thinking, just you know, agreeing that the doctor understands the impact psoriasis has on one's well-being is correlated with higher levels of, uh, of happiness. But we also have shown that um, this activity, you know, this interaction between the doctor and the patient around how, in this case specifically, psoriasis affects mental health is actually the last on the um, on the list, and we have involved, we were, we have been involved in a lot of conversations around this, um, this data to actually facilitate and start the conversation around then how we should uh, better design the interaction between the doctors and the patients to get the most out of it and really help patients, uh, patients improve. Um, this is just some of the keys, key results that we had with the type of data. Apart from the, uh, the fact that patient associations and patient advocates were able to use the data to make it very relevant in the local um, settings from improving copay in European countries, because they managed to use the data to highlight the importance of mental health, uh, to having debates in, in the parliament in another, in another European country. We also had, uh, even though um, Poland and China were not uh, represented in the first uh, report, they had national debates on the, on the news talking about this kind of like lost or left behind section of the society that is- Catalina, uh, can you come to the conclusion? Yes, yeah. I, I'm, I'll just, I was about to uh, conclude. So, um, it is to say that well-being data is very valuable and can be used to highlight quality of light for patients. But from what I have seen as well today is that I would suggest um, when developing the data storytelling in, co in collaboration with um, uh, other stakeholders to also be patient and perseverant because it can take some time to convince all the stakeholders in this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We should have given you more than seven minutes, Katalina. Thank you so much for <laughs> your okay. interesting Sorry. presentation. Sorry for being a little bit No, too long. It's, it's fine. It's all so interesting. So I think everybody is sitting on the point of their chair to listen and to 
to discuss later. Um, Thank you. And this ends actually our little sub part of quality of life and person centered care, the vision into reality. And we have now very interestingly another format of discussing this issue with you. And it's to present uh, case studies uh, where the, the use of uh, the concept of integrated care has been translated into a reality for people living with heart failure. And our first case, uh, case study, will be presented by Dr. Raif Sankar Narayanan, um, who will be speaking about experiences of delivering a multi-specialist, multidisciplinary uh, team model of care uh, in to manage long-term conditions at the Liverpool University Hospital Foundation Trust in the UK. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tini, and thank you uh, for the kind invite from the Heart Failure Policy Network. It's been especially uh, 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 you know, uh, interesting listening to all the other speakers who preceded me as well. My name is Rajiv Sankanara, so I'm a heart failure cardiologist from uh, Liverpool. Uh, so what I'd like to present to you uh, is our model of uh, delivering whole person of holistic care in heart failure, where we're just not managing heart failure on its own. It's also looking at the multimorbidity. So it's the Liverpool multi-speciality, multi-morbidity, heart failure, uh, MDT. So these are my uh, disclosures. So uh, people with heart failure, uh, we know that, uh, that they have several other uh, uh, coexisting conditions. It's not just the cardiac uh, conditions, but it's chronic kidney disease, there's coexistence of anemia, diabetes, uh, obesity, metabolic syndrome. COPD, sleep apnea, so chest pathologies, but are they frequently older and they're prone to falls and uh, there's the coexistence of frailty. Uh, there's also the overlap of uh, cachexia and cancer and proportion of uh, patients. Uh, and uh, these patients are frequently on multiple medications or what we call as polypharmacy, and therefore they're prone to the adverse drug reactions. And what we know of uh, uh, from uh, existing evidence, so this is one of the studies which is shown, that uh, heart failure on its own contributes to a minority of uh, causes in terms of hospitalizations. So it's the non-heart failure, non-cardiovascular uh, hospitalizations, which uh, uh, contribute to the majority of uh, the reasons why people uh, end up in hospital, really. So, so on the basis of this, we analyzed our own data. We looked at it a bit closer and we, uh, we decided to do something about this. And what, what our thinking process was, is it just the heart failure specialists or the heart failure team uh, who deem themselves as experts in managing heart failure and the, the coexisting conditions? Or do we end up uh, referring these patients to all these specialists? So that way, uh, we used to historically send patients to multiple other specialists, multiple clinics. And, and, and as I mentioned, these are frail elderly patients. So it's not a particularly comfortable or convenient for them to be attending multiple clinics. So, so the question was, what, what is the ideal team? I'm sorry about the football focus, but the World Cup is uh, upon us. So I thought, and coming from Liverpool, uh, I thought we'll bring a little bit of football into this. So what we thought is that the ideal team uh, should be a combination of things. So rather than sending patients to be seeing multiple other specialists, why not bring all the specialists together to discuss uh, each, each case in a holistic manner? So we brought together the primary care team, the secondary care and tertiary heart failure teams, but also brought in a nephrologist, a diabetologist, a chest specialist, a geriatrician, palliative care consultant, a pharmacologist and a pharmacist uh, to discuss uh, uh, you know, each case of uh, you know, people with heart failure and multimorbidity. And this is a, a virtual platform. So it's, it's, it's all about uh, teamwork. And what we did, uh, so our uh, model uh, was funded and uh, conveniently launched just before the COVID uh, pandemic, so in January 2020. And it was particularly useful uh, uh, you know, uh, during COVID where uh, a lot of patients uh, could not or did not want to uh, see healthcare providers uh, for fear of catching the infection. Uh, so, so there was a lot of isolation. So their heart failure uh, and non-heart failure care uh, you know, progressed quite nicely through this model. So what we did was we analyzed the outcomes of these patients uh, 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 you know, managed via this model for 18 months. So 334 uh, patients, we collected baseline characteristics, looked at their comorbidities via the Charlson comorbidity score, uh, but also looked at the frailty using the Rockwood frailty score and uh, analyzed their anticholinergic burden and their medications. And, and what we did was look at their outcomes before the MDT and after. And, and we specifically looked at all cause hospitalizations, but also outpatient clinic attendances, uh, the, the uh, various MDT uh, interventions and performed a cost analysis. So 
So our uh, paper was published in Heart BMJ. So the detailed uh, uh, outcomes are there in the paper as well. But briefly, so we did a comparison of uh, patients with uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction versus preserved ejection fraction. And, and the results were not uh, hugely different from what we already know. Uh, so our cohort is uh, elderly and multimorbid. Uh, predominance of ischemic heart disease in patients with HFREF, predominance of uh, hypertension and CKD in people with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, higher comorbidity index in people with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and a tendency to greater frailty in that cohort as well. Uh, so we then looked at some of the outcomes. Again, apologies for the crowded slide, but uh, in summary, we looked at all the heart failure interventions, medications optimization, uh, uh, advanced heart failure therapy, uh, referrals including devices. But importantly, uh, there was a lot of non-heart failure interventions as well. So we looked uh, closely at people with uh, diabetes and CKD, optimized their therapies, looked at the role of, uh, of potassium binders. Uh, we also agreed upon continuing prognostic RASI therapy despite renal dysfunction, because we know that the medications are, uh, are, are prognostically beneficial, not just for the heart, but also for the kidneys, because frequently medications are started by us as heart failure specialists, but then they get stopped by others. So we get a consensus opinion, and that adds to the weight of uh, uh, evidence in decision making. We also looked at uh, adverse drug reactions. And the interventions taken in the MDT showed a significant reduction in uh, hospitalizations or A&E presentations due to adverse drug reactions, such as falls, bleeding, uh, delirium or acute confusion state. Uh, we looked at optimization of chest conditions, uh, false assessment uh, referrals, but also advanced care planning and uh, timely palliative care input. And, and uh, these are some of the, uh, the outcomes we looked at. So the all-cause hospitalizations were significantly reduced by the uh, multi-speciality MDT uh, input, so pre versus post. And we looked a bit closer. Is this just the heart failure hospitalizations? Uh, it wasn't. So the heart failure hospitalizations, as we can see, were significantly reduced, but it was also the non-heart failure hospitalizations. And we could see that in terms of a reduction, like I said, in adverse drug reactions, but also the, uh, the multimorbid conditions of the associated long-term conditions, so chest, renal, diabetes, cerebrovascular, and other conditions. And we performed an out, uh, economic analysis because this model uh, did require... So your funding. time is almost so, up. You only have five minutes, sorry. Up, 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 up. And, and just be another two minutes. Yeah. So we looked at uh, the funding. So each specialty did require funding, but uh, uh, there was a significant cost saving through a reduction in outpatient clinic appointments, also significant uh, cost saving in terms of re reduction in hospitalizations, and therefore a total saving of uh, over 700,000 pounds during the study period. And this does not take into account the environmental impact where uh, patients don't need to travel, and uh, therefore there's also cost savings due to reduction in uh, cost due to travel and transport for patients. So in conclusion, this multi-speciality, multi-morbidity MDT management is, uh, we think it's patient-centered holistic care. It reduces patient uh, inconvenience and costs. Uh, it leads to seamless integration of care and improves efficiency and cross speciality. It leads to uh, cross-speciality learning. It's also significantly cost-effective as we've shown in our uh, model. And this is by reducing all cause hospitalization, clinic attendances. Thank you very much. So this is the whole team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, share also uh, Rajiv for his great example with us and also again acknowledge the importance of everybody in the team. So thank you so much. And so we have a second case, uh, and then I will stop pushing <laughs> the time. But uh, the second case is uh, of Pilar Mazon from the University of Santiago de Compostela. And Dr. Mazon will be speaking to us about the realities of delivering integrated collaborative care between cardiology and oncology in primary care settings in Spain. Welcome. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, can you see my screen, I hope? Yes. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I, I don't know if you have the opportunity to read the document uh, Spotlight on Cancer Treatment and Heart Failure, written by people from the Heart Failure Policy Network. And this is uh, the reason why I'm here to talk about uh, our experience uh, in the cardio oncology unit in collaboration with oncologists and also with primary care physicians. Um, recently, this is the guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology on Cardio Oncology. And here in these guidelines, there are many recommendations of how to act with these patients and how many studies we have to perform, when to start treatment. This is the main figure that illustrates the 
all the process of the patient with, with cancer before the diagnosis, during treatment, and also lifelong. There is a um, very interesting know exactly who need a cardio-oncology uh, approach, who need a, a very, very, very uh, close um, follow-up. And so we need to, to check or we have to calculate the risk of cardiotoxicity and the risk of developed heart failure due to cancer treatment. There are tools, there are apps. This is a performance from the Heart Failure Association with the International Cardio Oncology Society to calculate the risks of patients. And based on the risk and based on if the patient had before any cardiovascular uh, illness or disease, we have to start with primary or secondary prevention strategies or even with treatment for the cardiovascular problem. The main thing is who has to start with the treatment, who has to start with the prevention uh, strategies. And this is a, a chart, sorry, it's in Spanish, but it's because this is the original uh, figure. In the Spanish Society of Cardiology, there is a great project called SEC Excellence in Cardiology with different uh, small programs. One is related with a primary care, SEC Primary is called, and in this uh, program also there is a section about cardio-oncology integrated care. So in the figure uh, is where we can see when primary care has to act and how the role of hematologist, oncologist, of course, and also the role of the cardiologist. And also uh, recently, based on the guidelines, we have written a commentary in the Spanish Society of Cardiology as other cardiologists uh, societies in Europe. We just translate the guidelines from the ESC, but also we write a, com a commentary that we publish in the Spanish journal. And we have um, made this figure just uh, saying when, who, and how. And as you can see, we can give great importance to primary care, great importance to nurses, all, all over the process, because I, we have to forget the times when the patient during the cancer treatment disappear from the primary care. I, now the primary care physician must be there from the beginning and for the rest of the life of the people. And here another interesting thing that we have seen that improve quality of life is all programs related with exercise. For example, in our hospital, we have a program of cardiac rehabilitation for women with breast cancer. What we want to know if this exercise, these programs really prevent cardiotoxicity. But before having the main or the final results, what we have already shown is that the quality of life is improved and women are really very happy with these programs of cardiac rehabilitation, and if you cannot do that on the hospital, you just have to uh, make that people will exercise. And last, uh, last year, we wrote this kind of decalogue uh, to how to start a cardio-oncology unit, no? And the last four points from seven to 10, really they are um, directed to the patients. Uh, because we want to just facilitate their life, uh, avoid many visits to the hospital. And what is really important is maintain a permanent communication, not only between the professionals, but also with the patients. No? For example, I think that at this point 10 is where we can put the PROM, as Dr. Espertus explained before, patient reported outcome measures. And also based on that reports, we also can act in point six is update and modify activity based on experience, not only in the experience of the doctors, but also in the experience of the patients. And of course, always with the patient in the center of the problem. That's it. Thank you, wonderful. I almost uh, was uh, surprised that you finished because you finished so a long time and you had such an interesting presentation also sharing this um, 
uh, joint uh, effort, of course, for cardio, cardio oncology. And um, I also wanted to mention here that there will also be a patient version of the ESC guideline on cardio oncology. So that's also interesting to keep an eye on if you're uh, in this field or if you have patients uh, in this, uh, this area. So thank you all. And uh, now we move to a roundtable discussion. We have some time for that. And we have also a, uh, uh, we have invited a person who can sort of kick off the round, uh, roundtable discussion with a lot of expertise in the field and has this look from a more uh, policymaker point of view. So we invite Sirpa Pitikainen from Finland to be our first respondent uh, and see, uh, we would like to hear from you. What are your impressions of the presentations? And also you're probably outside the heart failure community, but how would you advise to the heart failure community to move forward uh, also to address this on a more uh, policy level? So uh, Sirpa, what do you think? Thank you very much, and thank you very much for allowing me to, to follow up your uh, very interesting talks uh, and asking me to part of this discussion. Actually, I'm very painfully uh, close to heart failure, not personally, but my father had a, uh, a heart failure where he then passed away. It is more than uh, 15 years ago, so it is not very, very recent. So, but I do have a very, very much sympathy in this, this field, uh, field and, and uh, this field of care. There were many interesting points what you raised. Um, you know, one to start with is the patient approach. And uh, that was the latest what we uh, uh, heard from Pilar also. The, the point that uh, the doctor should always meet with the patient not without the patient and then someone telling to the patient what is the outcome. The consultation process um, and uh, the patient rights. And uh, I like very much the idea that you have your version on, on for patients separately. And this very much is needed. Well, the second big point, um, what you supported with quite a lot of evidence and uh, studied what that is, is the quality of life. And uh, actually I started to be very amazed how little we actually talk about the quality of life of the patients. And um, that after all is almost as important and sometimes more important than uh, the how long the life actually continues. And there uh, the consultation process that sort of have uh, the uh, key questions and sort of a modeling how different doctors can address this quality of life issue is very crucial, uh, especially be uh, because heart failure causes quite a lot of these kind of a symptoms you might not have in, in some other conditions. Then uh, it was important that you also raise the psychological point of the I remember my father and myself too, uh, besides the cancer, uh, the heart failure has very bad uh, cling when you hear it and, and it brings quite a lot of anxiety for, for the relatives and, and for the patient itself. Then what would be my advice? I would be happy to continue this, but knowing the time limits, I'm just jumping to the conclusions and my recommendations needs that uh, why not start working to have a reference center in the Europe about heart failure. Not sort of all heart and uh, uh, heart diseases because this is quite a range, but heart failure. Why not create this uh, quality of life and the best treatment, especially a European guideline uh, uh, that should be followed in member states. Why not integrate the patient organizations to be part of this um, guideline and uh, the, the issues what you raised already, how to question uh, with the, um, uh, what is important that the doctor questions and uh, what, what are the effective, effective ways and, and the ineffective ways. And why couldn't we create 
a this kind of a, like we had the cancer plan, a big sort of a heart failure plan for Europe, where we would ask all the member states to um, to have their own heart failure uh, programs and then to implement it. There's a, quite a lot of uh, programs on asthma, on diabetes and cancers and so forth. But as far as I know, on heart failure, there isn't this kind of a pan-European roadmap and, and plan. And certainly seeing how uh, big issue this is, I think that that would be very advisable and maybe we could work uh, uh, then on the parliament and with other contacts and with member states, doctor and patient associations to, to make this happen. Uh, once again, very much thank you and um, very interesting discussion that I'm, I'm very glad to follow. Wonderful. Thank you, Sirpa. Thank you for that these reflections. And uh, um, I, th I think to, to comment a little bit is uh, there is a National Heart Failure Awareness Week, but we never sort of made it to the parliament and to the EU commissionaries, etc. So that is, I think, something, uh, a good next step to make and uh, to take also this heart failure awareness to a policy level. So I was just wondering, we have uh, Stephen and Nick, they talk talked a lot about their, uh, uh, not not enough, of course, about their findings and thoughts. And how do you now think about this uh, reflection of SIRPA on having a uh, quality of life heart failure reference center? What what would you what do you think? What what do you think from the advocacy uh, perspective? Nick, Stephen, we've worked too. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to who would speak oh, first. Okay. Uh, well, I think it's a really I think it's a really good idea. I've been, uh, I was diagnosed with heart failure in 2010, um, and there definitely hasn't been, uh, right across the stakeholder piece, enough involvement from patients um, and patient advocacy groups. Um, you know, we're very aligned with everybody else, but I don't think the voice is, 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 is as heard. Uh, and, and I think it's the remit of a patient organization or patient advocacy uh, or somebody in patient advocacy to um, promote quality of life as as an important metric uh, with patients. So I think it's a fantastic idea if there is um, wholesale stakeholder uh, support, then um, you can count the Pumpy Marvis Foundation in that. That's same for me. Um, I think that we, we talk a lot about patient centricity uh, and recently uh, talked about, yeah, we want in, uh, patient centricity when we are talking about, when we're in a care situation, but to get that patient centricity correct, we have to have, as Nick said, the patients have to be round the table and not in the middle of it. It's your patient centricity for care, but let us let us help, as he said, uh, Dave, E. Dave. Thank you. And and uh, Professor Matra, Matra also commented uh, already in the chat, but uh, you, in the heart failure guidelines, you had a patient uh, patient representative or not? Two, yeah. We had uh, two. We are having two representatives, yes. so that's uh, one is uh, is undergoing uh, heart transplantation. Uh, the other one has a, a cardiomyopathy that has recovered, and uh, and they 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 participated to the to all the meetings and uh, and um, also have uh, um, uh, they are allowed to vote. Uh, for the recommendations. Of course, I mean, uh, we are far from where uh, uh, other uh, specialties are, like uh, oncology, but uh, at least it was the first uh, <laughs> step in this direction. And, and yeah. this, this were the first time that uh, for the art failure guidance, this, uh, this has been uh, the first time that we have uh, two patients representatives in the task force. And uh, and now is the first time that we have an update, but this is the first time. Thank you, uh, Nick. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, I just want I just wanted to say that um, it's really important that um, so when you're looking for patient insights and you're looking for, for to shape policy and to shape how we do things, it's important that you take it from an organisational level, um, and because my voice is just my opinion, um, and mm -hmm individual patients are just so we need to work at an organizational level 
and 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 that was one of the things that I I wanted to try and bring up in the, the conversation that I had, which was that um, people living with heart failure, if they have the if they have the inclination, um, we need your help. Um, uh, Avec, uh, Pumping Marvelous, and all the other uh, patient organisations around the world um, and in Europe, we need your help. Come and join us, and we can then uh, shape the insights that we then deliver around the table, uh, which is important. It's not just individuals. No. Sorry, Stephen. Yeah, okay. No, I, as usual, uh, Nick and I share an awful lot of ideas and comment on it, and I agree. Um, I applaud the, the, the ESC for having included the patients um, for this task force, but I think it would be really interesting if patients had a place in the ESC, uh, a chair, uh, the same way that um, you you have nurses now, you have cardiac uh, health uh, heart failure nurses. Do you think it's possible? <laughs> well, they have the patient forum, uh, which is a very uh, well organized uh, group of uh, patients in the ESC. It's not only heart failure, so we don't have a special heart failure patient forum yet, uh, but we have patients in the ESC that are uh, really helpful in uh, yeah, in the guidelines and writing documents. But it also brings up a discussion that came from the chat actually is what is a, what is a good patient in a forum and in a guideline? Because uh, like I see, we, we all are quite often white, highly educated, uh, he high health literacy. Um, how much do we represent uh, in both in the guidelines, but also in our materials and in our policy, people who have different cultural backgrounds. Um, Nick, do you want to comment on that, or uh, is it? A, yeah, I or, think. Yeah, yeah. I think. I think. Yeah, I, I. I don't want to take center stage here, but I. We did a a, a, um, a big linguistic study uh, this year on how many times heart failure was mentioned in the UK Parliament. Um, and it's in the BMJ, uh, published in the BMJ, and the BMJ actually took it up as a, 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 a as a piece where they sent a press release out about it because they felt it was that significant. Um, but one of the one of the uh, elements was that we don't talk about heart failure enough, and um, in in all layers. And uh, UK MPs actually talked more about potholes, thirty seven times more about potholes from nineteen forty five to the present day. Uh, measured through Hansard than actually heart failure. So um, if you if you've got a bit of time, go and Google uh, BMJ heart failure linguistic study. We did it with the University of Lancaster, and I think that's a systemic problem that we've got, which is we just don't talk about it enough. No, oh, thank you. Can I give the word to Axel about the ethnicity and uh, minorities? How, how, because, you know, in the patient-centered care, it is still also people maybe with cognitive problems. And how do you handle that also on a practical but also on a policy level um yeah i mean of course that that's a challenge and and uh, i often hear this and and uh, i i hear it partly in in patient public involvement strategies um and and uh, what kind of role do i have as a patient do i represent myself or a patient organization and i would say that um it depends and and it's it's the most crucial that we do it more often than we do and i applaud the esc that we, we we have it in the guidelines and now we really need to push it to have it in the everyday setting also the patient involvement and from there on i think that we can increase and and um, uh, the volume of patient and patient organizations that are involved. Um, secondly, I think that, and this has been also during the COVID pandemic, uh, some 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 voices raised that person-centered care, for example, is only for the highly educated with uh, with a loud voice. And I, and I would say that, of course, um, we need to study this more. But those studies that are around concerning that would would uh, point to the opposite. In fact, there are studies published. Uh, one by Andreas Forst showing that the uh, uh, patients with with uh, with uh, uh, lower socioeconomic and educational level have the most increase in, uh, for example, self-efficacy when when uh, being cared for in a person-centered approach. So I think that the most important aspect is that we st we need to push and we need to get it in the everyday setting, both in clinic but in research and in policy. Um, and in that sense, I think that. 
What I'm most afraid of right now uh, is that we have had a very nice development also in the ESC and, and going forward, but post uh, COVID pandemic is that we we're right now a little bit in a split that we are splitting once again, I would say personalized medicine and one side and person centered care and integrated care as separate entities. And I think that we, and during this talk with all of you, I understand that we need to combine those uh, approaches. Thank I don't you. know if I answered your question, but yeah, uh, you did. <laughs> Syria, Sirfa, sorry. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to shortly uh, to intervene in two points. The the latest was um, on on this intervention um, <clears throat> about um, uh, about about having uh, or actually I start with Stephen and uh, the idea of having a police. Uh, I I know what you mean um, from my own experiences uh, with my father, and uh, what I think uh, what we would need in these recommendations is to have a specialized nurse or a doctor uh, to to uh, act as a uh, translator because this language, as we know, can get very complicated and there's a array of different kind of a medication choices and it's very hard to, to get on grip uh, what is possible and what is not and what are different kind of consequences. And that would be that kind of a mentor for the patient. Uh, that sounds to me that would be a useful idea. And uh, then the another one um, comes to the fact, uh, and especially for those people that are from minority groups or less educated than, than we are, and if it is difficult for us, then I can only imagine how it is for those ones not having uh, as, as much capabilities as some others. And the another one is, uh, should we have something about di early diagnosis or this kind of a methodology, how these conditions are um, found? And uh, the third one actually is the right to have a second opinion because sometimes you have very limited uh, doctoral resources and then, and that really happens if you have to, uh, happen to have very, uh, uh, how would say, not fitting combination personally with the doctor or uh, you at least feel th that the doctor is co incompetent. It might be very difficult to get the second opinion, second uh, thought, what is possible and uh, what is not. and. Uh, that would facilitate the rights of the patient. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think we would have much more to discuss. I did not even have the chance to, you know, give the word to everybody and ask each other questions, which we really wanted to do. But uh, I would like to thank you all and uh, for these great discussions and also to, again, uh, under strike that we have uh, such a big, a lot of work to do in the field of you know patient-centered care, person-centered care, quality of life measurement, quality of life in the guidelines involving patients. So it's been a great um, time here with you and, and sharing our, our thoughts and our experience. And I would like to give the word to Ed for a few final closing things. Thank you so much, uh, Tini. Um, thank you all to our speakers, many of whom may now have to go. So all that's left for me is to say huge thanks. Uh, this is the final session of the 2022 summit. Uh, so I'd like to give a massive appreciation to, uh, to the team and to colleagues uh, old and new. So huge thank you to Joe Farrington Douglas, Kirsten Budig, uh, Carrie Laurenti, Catherine Hodge, Henry Arnold, Madeline Murphy and Francesca Butler. Uh, also to our events provider, Outsourced Events, and to um, all those who have spread word of this summit through their networks and taken part. We can't do it without you. Um, it's our massive honor and privilege to, uh, uh, to be involved in this way in the summit. So um, I do hope you'll join us again next year. Um, we've seen the summit grow very significantly in terms of uh, colleagues joining us and also in attendance. Um, we're incredibly excited to continue this tradition and we'd love to hear from you all in the heart the community as to what you want from the summit, what we should be looking at next year and how this summit can help you do what you want to do, which is to get heart failure up the political agenda uh, and ensure that we get the right care and support for those living with heart failure. So it's our privilege and pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>